78-year-old male presents to the clinic four weeks after a left total shoulder arthroplasty. He has not been wearing his sling, so he's non-compliant. Reports he developed increased pain after slipping in the shower. He used his arm to catch himself from falling. On exam, he can flex the shoulder to 70 degrees, so below 90, so he's pseudo-paralytic just by that history, probably, and limited by pain. Active external rotation with the arm at the side is 50 degrees, and active internal rotation is 5 degrees. Passive external rotation is out to 80 degrees, so he's got more external rotation than we would normally expect. And you know where this is pointing towards, of course, the radiograph of the left shoulder shown below in figure A. Here's the radiograph. Nothing too exciting on this view here. Uh, typically, what you would like to see is an axillary lateral, and you'll see that the humeral head has subluxed and not in its normal position. What other complaint is the patient most likely to have? Pain with over the bicepal groove. Uh, for many of us, that was redressed at the time of surgery. Um, pain over the subdeltoid bursa. Uh, that's a pretty nonspecific area. Pain over the lateral shoulder. Uh, shoulder instability with external rotation. Shoulder instability with internal rotation. And I think you're aware of the diagnosis they're leaning towards, and that's a subscapularis failure after surgery. So he's going to have a sensation of instability with external rotation. Um, and that's listed here in the various categories uh, for managing this. Uh, this is a really devastating problem. The recommendation is go in and repair it, uh, but I can tell you that it's rare that that solves the problem, and you can almost guarantee that the result that they would have had if there had been no problem after surgery is never achievable again. So if you go back in and re-repair it, usually something's not right. The subscapularis is never going to be normal, and these people really struggle. And a 78-year-old, I think a lot of people would lean right towards just converting it over to a reverse if the patient remains symptomatic, because that's the only thing that's going to stabilize that shoulder and give them a long-term result. Um, total shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, we've kind of compared all these things, so we'll go through this fairly quickly, but uh, obviously total shoulder arthroplasty is a, is a great operation. When you look at these lower views here, the key is an anatomic head in the right spot, and now we've learned that whether you have a standard stem, a short stem, or a stemless type device, which are all available now in the market, as long as the head stays in the right spot and is positioned well, and you have good balance of your cuff and your glenoid is good, you're fine. And so the point is, is that the stem is not as critical uh, in shoulder arthroplasty as it might be in the femur, for example. Um, of course, what we want to see for the total shoulders, they've got to have good bone stock, proper alignment of the joint after arthroplasty, and they've got to have a good rotator cuff to get the best results. Um, uh, isolated supraspinatus tear, especially a small and degenerative total shoulder arthroplasty if the rest of the cuff is perfectly fine. If they have a degenerative supraspinatus with grade 3 or 4 fatty infiltration, the infraspinatus is involved in a little bit of the subscapularis, then you're going to lean towards a reverse, especially as the patients start getting over the age of 65. And you see here that incidence of rotator cuff disease with osteoarthritis, and you've got to have glenoid bone stock to put a glenoid in place, as you see here. And it's a very reliable operation um, in most patients, worse in people that have had prior surgery, like instability surgery, and they present with the condition. We talked about the capsulorapy arthropathy. We already talked about the Walsh classification here, uh, so I won't go through that again. That's just important. The Bs are very difficult. The Cs are usually treated with hemiarthroplasty, well, preferably no surgery, but oftentimes hemiarthroplasty. Total shoulder arthroplasty would be the most appropriate treatment in which of the following arthritic patients. 75-year-old female with long-standing history of brachial plexus palsy. Not ideal. 63-year-old male with six-month history of shoulder pain and inability. Oops, I think I clicked too early. Sorry. 63-year-old male with a six-month history of shoulder pain and inability to abduct past 30 degrees. Big red flag. Got to check out the cuff. 67-year-old female with chronic shoulder pain and evidence of a significant proximal migration of the humeral humerus on x-ray, again, rotator cuff disease. 70-year-old female with severe shoulder pain, radiographic evidence of glenoid erosion to the coracoid process. That's like that one we saw before, so there's really no glenoid bone stock left. Maybe a hemi might be, uh, but certainly not a total because you can't get the glenoid in. The last one, 72-year-old male, nine-month status, post a right total knee for osteoarthritis, so he's got it throughout his body. And now he's got shoulder pain and MRI showing intact rotator cuff. So that would be the ideal patient for a total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, again, uh, we've talked about some of these indications. 
It's all pretty straightforward. Here's another question for you. Which of the following preoperative factors is a contraindication of total shoulder arthroplasty? And you see up here, when you look at the questions like how long is, how many times it's been asked and things like that, this is a very common question or some variation of this on these tests. So uh, the, again, preoperative factors, contraindication, passive external rotation less than 10 degrees. That's a stiff shoulder. That's okay. Eccentric posterior glenoid erosion. Two centimeter full thickness supraspinatus tendon tear, inflammatory arthritis, preganglionic brachial plexus injury. And I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, you really don't have much value in doing these operations if they really have a preganglionic brachial plexus injury. This is the patient, the rare patient, where we might even consider a fusion. Uh, in the right setting. If their hand is working well and, and they all above the plexus has is, is, uh, had a problem. But the others are all reasonable indications. They were trying to test you on the two centimeter full thickness supraspinatus tear, uh, but that's a reasonable indication. Which of the following clinical circumstances would it be appropriate to eccentrically ream the anterior glenoid? Um, <clears throat> and so this is asking about how you manage uh, the glenoid when there's deformity and there's been wear posterior, so the B1s and B2s. 72-year-old male undergoing shoulder arthroplasty due to rotator cuff arthropathy, um, that's a concern. 65-year-old female with a glenoid retroversion of 13 degrees, what's normal? Normal glenoid retroversion is around 7 to 8 degrees, so this is increased undergoing shoulder arthroplasty. 70-year-old female with humeral antiversion of 13 degrees undergoing shoulder arthroplasty. It's very rare to have humeral antiversion uh, uh, that's causing this kind of problem. 65-year-old female with glenoid retroversion of 25 degrees undergoing shoulder arthroplasty. And a 59-year-old male with significant glenoid bone stock deficiency and severe osteoarthritis. Again, which one would it be appropriate to eccentrically ream the anterior glenoid? And this is an effort to correct the version that's present. And so that's going to be the lady that has about 13 degrees of retroversion. We know from good studies, you can correct about 10 degrees. The literature suggests up to 15, but you really start to take away a lot of bone. So most of us say you can correct up about 10 degrees of version. And then, so this lady, if you want to correct her from 13 down to five or very close to normal, then that would be great. But if you're trying to go from 25 down to 10 or less, you're going to erode and take away way too much bone. So it's something to keep in mind. It says here the normal version of the glenoid is 0 to 3 degrees, but uh, there's been a number of studies that have looked at this and uh, said it's right around about 7 degrees, some variations in, in different population or ethnicity, but it's right around 7 degrees. And so we, we don't have to correct them down to 0. That's the important point. So if they're 15 degrees and you can correct down to 7 five degrees, that's very doable, and it's not going to take away too much bone. You don't have to go all the way down to zero degrees. Um, and so I think that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Contraindications, again, this comes up a lot, as you see, insufficient glenoid bone stock, rotator cuff disease. Those are the two major ones, deltoid dysfunction or the neurologic conditions that we've already heard a couple of questions asked about. The x-rays, we talked about that. We like to get a CT scan, preferably a 3D CT scan, and supplement with an MRI in patients with osteoarthritis that we think they have rotator cuff disease. The approach is the same as a hemiarthroplasty, deltal pectoral, um, and we typically uh, then have to decide what to do uh, for the subscapularis, and there's a few different ways to do that. Uh, one is a a tenotomy, the other is a peel, and the last one is with an osteotomy. Everybody is, uh, has a champion in each of those categories, uh, but someone likes those. Um, complications, axillary nerve is the most common complication. The other one that we see, uh, and it can be from the retractor, is the musculocutaneous nerve. So you have to be careful about that. We try not to just retract statically throughout the entire procedure to give the neurologic structures a little break during the operation. Again, in terms of how we release this, uh, we do an anterior release of the capsule. Uh, we don't really do Z lengthenings anymore. The tissue is too flimsy to do that. So we take the tendon off laterally, and then we release the capsule off the glenoid rim, and then that's the mobility that we get out of the subscapularis uh, uh, primarily. Um, 
uh, again, uh, glenoid deficiency and retroversion, we have to be very careful about that. Here's an example where we see retroversion, and we're going to have to figure out preoperatively how we're going to address that. There are some newer ideas about uh, augmented glenoids and step cut glenoids. I don't think you'll get those kind of questions because we don't even have five year follow up on them to know whether that's going to make a long term uh, outcome difference. And this is what's typically been recommended over the years, as you see here in these views, and this is reflective of of the previous question where there's some retroversion and what you do is you try to adjust to the patient's paleoglenoid, their old glenoid here, and then you've got to bring that down to where they have lost some bone. And again, if you have to correct this more than 10 degrees, you have to be worried that other options may be uh, necessary, bone grafting and other things, which is very complicated. 62-year-old man complains of shoulder pain for two years. He's had one course of intraarticular sodium hyaluronate and six weeks of physical therapy with little relief. Um, examination reveals diminished arm flexion and abduction secondary to pain. Radiographs of his shoulder are fig shown in figures A and B, so let's look real quick and see. Okay, that is an osteoarthritic shoulder. There's a large goat's beard that we see down here. There's some medial wear. You also see the posterior wear with subluxation. So these are challenging cases, uh, to say the least, in these patients. So he's 62 years old. Now, according to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Clinical Practice Guidelines, what is the next best step. And so we've had the x-rays, uh, he's had physical therapy, and he's had an injection. So <clears throat> humeral head replacement, hemiarthroplasty ream and run glenoid procedure, cuff tear arthropathy prosthesis, total shoulder arthroplasty with metal back glenoid component, total shoulder arthroplasty with polyethylene glenoid component. So I, I'm sure you guys are all very clever and you know that when they put two sentences almost exactly the same and change one thing, it's very likely that the examiner is trying to test you on that topic. And so keep that in mind when you take these tests and you're not really sure. And we know as we look at this here that the right answer for this individual in 2017 is a total shoulder arthroplasty with an all polyethylene cemented glenoid component. The metal black is a nice idea. We have seen that they wear out sooner. It's actually the metal doesn't have a problem. It's the polyethylene is the problem. And that usually takes seven to 10 years. And then it can be fairly devastating. We don't do a CTA prosthesis in a patient who has an intact cuff. We uh, don't do a ream and run. Generally, there are. Uh, there's one person in particular that does this operation and really, really is impressed with the results and how they do, uh, but that's not what the clinical practice guidelines would tell you to do, and we wouldn't do a HEMI in this patient. So that covers a very wide swath of that whole subject just with that one question. Um, the glenoid component, uh, we, there's been a variety of advancements in this area, including uh, making it so there's a slight incongruity or nonconformity between the glenoid, so it's a little bit flatter than the humeral head to try to absorb some of those forces. It's been all poly has won the day up until now. Uh, you see now a number of companies have developed this kind of a, a fluted central peg, uh, which seems to have some value in terms of stability, although we don't have 10-year follow-up on this, and the, some of the best results that published in the world are with an all-poly keeled glenoid component still, even today. And so we just have to keep in mind uh, uh, we have a lot of work to do on this. Um, the uncemented glenoid has a lower rate of loosening. Um, that's with regards to, I'm not really sure why it says that, um, it's this cemented glenoid uh, is what we use with all poly, but an uncemented metal back, the metal does not come loose, it's the poly wear that occurs. So just make sure you understand that. And uh, that's an important uh, factor. During a total shoulder arthroplasty, which of the following technical maneuvers would most likely place the rotator cuff tendons at risk of injury? Excessive retraction on the deltoid during the deltal pectoral approach, uh, the palpation of the rotator cuff insertion prior to humeral head resection, a humeral cut with 30 degrees of retroversion, excessive bone removal with the humeral neck osteotomy, and a humeral cut with 45 degrees of inclination. And I think you can tell what that is. So the excessive bone removal with the humeral neck osteotomy. And the idea is that 
as we talked about earlier, you find the anatomic neck and you make your resection right at that point. So that means you've got to see where the cuff is inserting, you've got to see the posterior aspect of the articular surface, you've got to see the inferior border. So to make a plane, you need to have three points. So that superior aspect, the inferior aspect, and the anterior aspect will give you that plane, and you just have to make sure that you don't lift up your hand and go too sharp a cut posteriorly and get into the rotator cuff. And that's a devastating injury, too. You can't just repair the rotator cuff and expect them to do well. They won't. So you don't want to cut the rotator cuff. Um, the position of the stem should be somewhere uh, around 20 to 40 degrees of retroversion. But again, we use the patient's anatomy. And we try to avoid putting the uh, stem in varus or valgus. Uh, you want to avoid overstuffing. Uh, that's a, a problem where uh, if even three to five millimeters will change the kinematics of the shoulder. You really, really want to get this to match up very carefully uh, between what you take out in terms of this diameter and what you put back in. And one of the keys to anatomic shoulder replacement was the, the actual recognition uh, by a French group of surgeons and their engineers that there's a fixed ratio between the head height and radius of curvature. So if you know what this diameter is, which we can tell from the cut surface, then you can guess what the actual head height is. It's about 0.75. And that's been a really helpful uh, tool for us to make sure that we do a good job with that. Humeral fractures can occur, especially with press fit stems. Um, my mentor, Dr. Matson, his key was love at first bite. And the idea was is that when you are broaching and preparing it, the first time you come in contact with the humeral cortex, you're done. And that works out very well. You don't need to fit and fill uh, in the humerus to get a good long-term results. Um, <clears throat> we start with essentially very careful protective movement um, for the first four to six weeks because we have to protect the subscapularis. We don't want to have them unprotected and have a subscapularis tear. And then uh, there's a variety of different ways uh, to repair this, but you want, as is shown in this example, something really strong and robust. Two or three sutures is not enough. You usually use six to eight sutures, depending on your repair technique, or some people even use uh, these uh, tapes, uh, which can be quite nice and secure for that. Uh, if you do have a problem with weakness after surgery uh, related to the anterior part of the shoulder, you have to test for the subscapularis, which is a little tricky. Um, we, you know, you do a belly press test, which is fine. Reach behind the back, usually they can't do early on, and uh, you, you make sure about this. And sometimes we have to get an ultrasound test. Uh, and there are some ways to get a metal subtraction MRI that might be helpful. Uh, glenoid loosening is the most common cause of total shoulder failure over the lifetime of the shoulder. Uh, and as we said, we're still getting uh, more than 90% of these to be in place uh, and functioning without revision up to 10 years after surgery. The, they look loose. In fact, uh, somewhere up to 40 to 50% of them actually have signs of loosening at five years out after surgery. But the revision rate at 10 years is less than 10%. So that's uh, pretty good. Um, we do look for radiographic lines just to see what's going on, but um, as I just mentioned to you, uh, ra the lucency lines do not correlate with symptoms. Um, and again, they, they presented here that 50% of patients as early as three to four years will start to get a progression of radiolucent lines. Um, and we do see that, but we treat the patient symptomatically, and most of them are doing very, very well. We don't have to worry about that uh, at all. Uh, humeral stem loosening is very rare. Uh, it can occur with, an, and so the first, if you see that in the first couple of years, it's infection until proven otherwise. That's how rare it is. It's got to be an infection until you prove it's not an infection. Um, sometimes you put, it can be put in under size. That might be another option. Subscapularis repair failure, that's one of the biggest complications that we really worry about. It's, um, and oftentimes it's because of noncompliance in that first six weeks. Patients try to push themselves out of a chair or use their arms too much. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, if it dislocates out the front, the subscapularis has failed until proven otherwise. If it dislocates out the back, you need a CT scan because there's probably something wrong with your glenoid. And then, of course, uh, infection is a big issue for us. Uh, there's been some recent reports that arthroscopic tissue culture is very sensitive and specific for that. Uh, fluoroscopically glided aspirations, as we've seen in the hip, are not so valuable. And unfortunately, as we've learned from the Mayo Clinic and others, there's a very, very high false negative with all the testing for infection. So you have to have a high clinical suspicion of these problems. So here's a question here. Which of the following statements regarding proprioterobacterium 
acne infections after shoulder arthroplasty is incorrect. It usually is associated with fevers. Cultures need to be held for 14 days. It colonizes the shoulder at increased rates compared to the knee and hip. Men have a higher bacterial burden than females. It is an important cause of clinical implant failure. So these are really good questions as you look at the answer here. Um, cultures, 14 days, and some people say even 21. It colonizes, it's amazing, more than two-thirds of all shoulder infections after arthroplasty are from P. acnes, and that's not true with hips and knees. Men have a higher bacteriological burden, very true. The male between 40 and 60 with a shoulder arthroplasty has persistent pain, even though the radiographs looks normal. You have to have a high suspicion that their shoulder's infected. And so that's a big issue for us. And we're still trying to figure out what exactly is the right way to prevent this from happening. There's a lot of things that are going on to try to figure that out. Um, it's the most common cause of inulin infection and implant failures in shoulder arthroplasty. The rate's been listed as 1% to 2% after primary total shoulder. It's a gram positive. This is an area where you could be tested because this is so common in shoulder arthroplasty that they can ask you some questions about that. Um, there are high bacterial burden around the shoulder. It mostly comes from the axilla, so we really do as much as we can to prepare that. But what's been very interesting is that P. acnes actually not only lives on the skin, it lives in the dermis. And so we're very worried that just by the very nature of cutting and working into the shoulder, we're contaminating the patient's shoulder arthroplasty area with their own bacteria. So there's a lot of ideas to try to how to prevent that. And as you see here, it's more common in males than in females. It oftentimes presents later, like they don't get that really hot, red, swollen, uh, purulent shoulder early on. It's basically, they oftentimes present with just, just not feeling right. Their shoulder just keeps bothering them, it's more painful, and the symptoms won't go away. Um, and as, I, as you've seen here, we keep for a minimum of 14 days, uh, and uh, if we're not sure what's going on, an uh, arthroscopic biopsy can be helpful to try to figure this out ahead of time. Over time, you'll start to see loosening around the implant, around the humeral implant in particular, uh, occurring within the first two years, and that's kind of a dead giveaway that that's what you're dealing with. And so there is some question about whether you can do a single stage or two stage reimplantation, uh, but um, uh, I think in 2017, the standard would be a two stage reimplantation, but we're seeing more and more surgeons. Uh, doing a single stage reimplantation if it's picked up early on. Uh, and that's particularly true with the reverse prosthesis. So it's kind of interesting. We'll have to pay attention to that. Um, early infection can be treated with open irrigation debridement, usually exchange of the parts that are not fixed to the bone, too. Late infection, again, a two stage reimplantation has the best success rate. But there's been some remarkably recent reports that suggest a single stage may be valuable. So that older patient who's going to be devastated by having at least two more operations and bone loss and everything else, uh, there may be an indication for a single stage just taking out the parts that can be, leaving the central portions, leaving the parts in the bone and coming back. But two stages, I think, the standard of care in 2017. Other complications, neurologic injuries, we've talked about axillary nerve, secondary, uh, second one is the musculocutaneous, and then periprosthetic fracture, usually most commonly from trying to overstuff the stem. Um, there is a classification scale, which was written up by the uh, guys up at the Mayo Clinic, and they talk about type A, uh, where it goes, where the stem is still in present, type B at the tip of the stem, and type C, um, and uh, these are all uh, important. Um, there's <clears throat> a lot of these can be treated non-operatively, uh, and will do okay. Uh, so the early treatment oftentimes is conservative management as long as the stem uh, remains stable. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.